Hello everyone, my name is Joe Sorson, Challenge Squad Scores on Enterprises, and today, today's video, we're going to be making a uh, gamma exposure and delta exposure options trading strategy. We're going to be back testing, we're going to be doing it locally. Locally, I don't know why I said it like that, but um, yeah. You might hear that and think, huh, delta exposure, gamma exposure, that sounds like an option strategy. Where are we going to get that options data? Well, I'm so glad that you asked that because that leads us to the sponsor of today's video, which is Databento. Databento provides market data APIs. They provide a historical one and a live one. They support Python, C++, and Rust for their client libraries and for the APIs, uh, HTTP, WebSockets, and raw data. And they have a lot of different schemas, a lot of different schemas, a lot of different fields, API methods, um, sampling frequencies. They have everything that you might need that you even think that you need. Yeah, they have things that you don't think you need. And then you're like, wow, I'm really happy that they have that. Uh, you can sign up today and get $125 in free credits. Thank you again to Databento for sponsoring this video. So the way that we're going to be doing this is we're going to be building on a uh, tutorial that Databento has in their, um, in their docs, right? So I looked at this code and I was like, this is the perfect starting point. I changed it up a little bit to make it a little bit more efficient and just a little micro optimization and um, also just because I think it's cool. And that is how we're going to be getting our data. Then we're going to be doing some analysis to it, getting our gamma exposure and delta exposure and making a little backtesting strategy for it. So there's a lot in this video. We have about 620 lines of code here. So I'm going to go through the data bento code obviously how we're getting this data frame right here we're going to be going through that i'm going to be spending less time on how we're finding the implied volatility because i have a video about that on my channel already i'm going to go over it but just not as in depth as i might if it was what the video is about i'm going to go over how we're getting our gamma and delta exposure and the strategy but i'm not really going to go over the architecture of the back testing because it is um it's 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 simple. It's lean. It does what it does, and so yeah, a little bit just for efficiency. But so we have all our all of our imports in here, importing data bento as db. I'm loading my environment variable, right? Obviously, oops, not that. This, um, just um, storing my API key in an env file. If you guys aren't familiar with that, there we go. There's my face back, and you might have also noticed some other files. But so getting our key, getting our historical client so that we can actually request some stuff. And yeah, we're going to go through and we're going to get everything. First difference you're going to see here is that this is an async function. Um, Python isn't actually multi-threaded or like not actually. No, yeah, that is the word for that. Uh, GLI, G-I-L, Global Interpreter Locker. Um, <laughs> not a video about that, but so just take these optimizations with a grain of salt. It is still Python. I just wanted to work with pandas. So that's why I didn't um, do it in Rust. But we're going to be saving our data into some um, files right here just because it does take some time to request it. So we're going to be, um, if we ever wanted to have a strategy and just tweak it a little bit each time, see, how, see what's going on, see how things change, we don't, want to, we don't want to wait for a request every single time. So we're going to be saving some stuff to a parquet. Parquets are faster than CSVs. We're going to be getting some start dates for everything. Make sure everything is synced. And we are going to first attempt to read our data frame from the parquet if we have it. If we do have it, make sure everything is in date time and return it. If not, we go got to do some data bento requests. So we want to get our front month futures contract. We're going to be doing this on futures also. <laughs> it is in the, um, it's in the example and I thought I'd just stick with it. I think it's a good idea. So we're going to be doing this on uh, CL contracts, on crude oil contracts. So we want to do that. We want to get our front month ID. We want to get the futures contract that's closest to us. And we want to get all the option definitions on that um, symbol for that futures contract. For CL, it's LL. So and also, this is one of the other changes I made in async get range. It makes more sense down here because I'm doing them like right after each other so I can gather them. But 
still small little optimization. So we're going to await that, get our data frame, uh, get all of our options on a front month contract, and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to get market by price data for our futures contract and trade schema for the um, options contract only on that front month. We're going to await that, get all of our get our data frame, everything that we would need, keep the columns that we need, and we're going to join the options so that way we have the trade schema, the trades information, and the definition information, right? Because remember, we had a schema with uh, trades and the schema with definitions. So preserve all that um, sorted by the index. And then we're going to join it. Um, we're going to join our options data frame and our market by price data frame from the futures contract. So that way we have the contracts for the futures contract and the futures contracts bid and ask price. So then we're just going to rename the columns as well so it's easy to work with, save it to a park app, and then return that data frame. Sweet. Now we have all of our data bento data in our um, main right here. So again, looking at our data set that we have um, our symbol, option symbol, a start and end, and our contract multiplier because it is a CL contract. So now we have our data frame. Now we're going to do that same kind of sanitization for a file path because I wanted to set the path here for whatever reason I decided when I was first <laughs> making this. Um, now we're actually going to calculate our gamma exposure and our, del and our delta exposure. Again, just try to read it, if we can read it. Um, if not, we're going to make a copy of our data frame, preserve our initial data. Um, a little bit of debugging still in here, that's fine. <laughs> and then we're going to um, parse some information that we would need, our strike price and our option type if we have a put or a call and our strike price when we're expiring. Not, our, not when we're expiring, our strike price is our strike price. I'm, assu I'm assuming you have knowledge, of, like basic knowledge of options if you're watching this video. Next we're going to use a midpoint as our spot price and we're going to calculate our time to expiration in years. Um, so now to calculate our gamma exposure and our delta exposure, we're going to filter out really out of the money strikes. Um, just when you get further out, sometimes the numbers can just get weird and things can get ex things can get larger and um, this isn't a video about handling those extreme events. It's a video about getting gamma exposure and delta exposure. So we're not going to do that for this one. So we're going to filter that out, make a new column for if we have a call or a, call or a put. Um, and now we need to calculate our implied volatility. To do that, we're going to estimate it. So we have our premium, the actual market premium, the spot price of the underlying, strike price, risk-free rate, time to expiration, and if we have a call or not. We're going to start with an initial guess for our implied volatility. Then we're going to iterate through. We're going to price a contract with all those first parameters, right? We're going to price a contract with that and our initial guess volatility. We're going to get that price. We're going to get our first derivative, right? Next, we're going to calculate our vega. Vega is an option Greek that determines, it explains how the options premium will change when applied volatility changes. So we're going to get our vega and we're going to get the difference between the actual market price, the actual market price that we have and the price that we just calculated. If those things are close enough, sweet, we're, we're good. We can return our sigma. If they're not, then we have to change our sigma. We have to add our difference between the prices over our vega. That is a newton raphson step. That is how we're going to estimate it. And we're going to keep on doing that over and over and over again until we get close enough. Until either we get close enough, we have a, um, mamma mia, we have an event where we have a got extreme value, or our looping stops. So that is how we're estimating our implied volatility. Save that in a row. Um, we need that for gamma. It's a part of the gamma formula. Right now we have all of our implied volatility. Um, if for some reason we have an issue calculating it, um, we're just going to handle that, and we also just want to keep on keep track of how many options we can actually successfully calculate it on. Now we want to calculate our Greeks. So same thing uh, for every index that we have, and we just want to make sure again a little bit of input input validation. We want to um, get our first derivative for the information at that row. Then we can calculate our delta at it, which is just the uh, cumulative distribution function for the first derivative for a call. For a put, it's the same thing, just minus one. And we also want to calculate our gamma for that row. 
which is the um, probability density function at that first derivative, and then over our spot times our sigma times our um, square root of t. That's why we need to estimate our implied volatility. Next, once we have those Greeks calculated, again, a little bit of nans, a little bit of uh, handling with that. And then to actually get our gamma and our delta exposure, we want to get the um, delta times the size, pretty much how many options are there, times our contract multiplier times our spot price. And then for our gamma, we're going to do pretty much the same thing, but we want to scale it. We want to put this over 100 because that'll represent it as a 1% um, change in the price, not in a dollar change in the price. Um, it's a common technique. I just, I like looking at it a bit more like that. Um, yeah, one of those things, if we didn't do it, it would still work, but we're going to do it. We just want to explain it differently. Um, next, we want to just see if it's, if we're on the ask side of things, that means that we're looking at the sellers. So we're going to make sure that we um, accurately represent that we're selling or that we're looking at sells. So we're going to make a negative. Next, say that DF or say that data frame to a part get and return that data frame. Now we have our data frame with our Greeks. So we're going to get a little bit of a summary right here. We're going to get all of our delta exposure, again, exposure and our average uh, spot price at the timestamp. Rename everything, make everything nice, nice. A little bit of debugging, just print it out. We also want to aggregate our strikes. Um, aggregate our Greeks by the strike price. That way we have um, just a different kind of view of it. We're going to see that in the figures as well. Again, a little bit of debugging, print everything out. Um, exposure by strike price. And we want to get the net exposures over the... Um, over all of our positions right here. So next we're going to plot some graphs. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Just we're going to literally look at them later. So just our gamma, our delta exposure over time, gamma exposure over time, our price, and then our um, gamma exposure by strike, our delta exposure by strike. And yeah, that is all. After we get all that plotted, I feel like I'm talking a little fast, but it's a 12 minute video. And I think we're at a good, good pace, honestly. And next, we're going to back test a simple strategy. So we have some thresholds, and we have a contract multiplier. Um, Hard-coded. I should change that. I'm probably going to change that before. Um, let's change it right now. <laughs> um, we're going to say contract multiplier. We don't have one locally, right? Yeah, no, it just knows that because it's around, so let's change it right now together. Cool, and we're just going to pass it in. So we're going to do it right after our data frame. And then down here, it is also our contract multiplier. Sweet. All right, so now let's hop back up there. Not that. Hop back up here. Perfect. Now, we have an initial account balance. We have a percent of our account that we're going to put on each trade. That's going to be used later. Um, and we have some things we need to keep track of, like what our position is, if we're long or short, our entry price, realized P&L, total trades, winning trades, losing trades. Initialize all the columns in our data frame. Um, and now, we, now it's time for the actual strategy, which is where the fun begins, right? So we're going to, we're going to start at the second index, so the one column, zero, one, right? And um, so that way this previous stuff isn't an issue. Get our previous delta exposure, even though we don't use it, our previous gamma exposure, and our, our current delta and gamma exposure, and our spot price. So a positive flip, we're going to define it as the gamma exposure being below our threshold. Excuse me. A positive flip is our gamma exposure being above our threshold and then going below it, and our get delta exposure being above the threshold. This is... Um, we're using the delta exposure to kind of see where the pressure might be what the bias is, where, where we're using this as our directional indication, and we're using the gamma exposure to see where the dealer is at, where the market maker is at, to see where they'll have to hedge. This would be a scenario where, ideally, they don't have to sell into the uptrend. They don't have to hedge themselves 
at least as much into an uptrend and then the same thing down here but for a downtrend. And this is what's giving us that directional indication based on the actual exposure, right? This is real. This is the market's exposure to these different positions. And we're trying to trade along in a way where it's um, the easiest for the market to go in that direction. There's the least amount of resistance in the literal dollar amount and people having to hedge. So now I'm not going to go over this too much. I've already done that testing video on this channel. I made um, a pretty cool one in Python. If you guys check out the uh, advent of code videos that I've done, um, edit a quant finance one. I might do that again. Leave a comment down below if you want me to do something like that again. But um, yeah, then we can calculate unre unrealized PNL. Just keep track of it for our data frame. Right on every loop, then we have to update the columns, and then um, keep track of everything. Keep track of our position management. If we are short, yep. If we're short and we have a positive flip. We're flipping between long and short. There isn't risk defined as like, this is my stop loss, this is my take profit. We're just trading with the market pretty much. We're flipping between it based on the exposure. So we have a positive flip and uh, and we're short. We're going to close that short, keep track of our total trades. If we have a winning trade or not, and our count balance, we're going to open a long trade. So uh, in risk for trade two, we're keeping track of the number of contracts that we can have based on the percent of the account that we want to put on each trade. We're going to do that for the other side of it as well. If we're um, long, we have a negative flip. Same concept. Keep track of our total PNL and our win rate at the end with our winning trades over our total trades. And we, then we can return all that good stuff and we can plot our account balance, which is just plotting the data frame this column. That is all that we have. So now let's go over some output. I already have it all loaded up here. So that is the first data frame that we got right here. This is our gamma exposure and delta exposure summary. And this is our um, exposure by strike price. Right, So we have a lot of strikes out here, right? And so now we have our total delta exposure, total gamma exposure, and we have some trades in this scenario. Total trades, 411. Our win rate is just below 50. However, we actually look at the information from those back tests. Here are those first figures. So we have our delta exposure over time. We have our gamma exposure over time with our spot price. We have our exposure by strike. And um, I want to get the spot. This is, <laughs> I probably should have, there we go. We have our spot price right there. And then the exposure based on the strike prices, right? So strike is 70 and there's um, $100 million in uh, delta exposure. Same concept right here for gamma. And then we have our actual strategy. And so this happens to be a strategy where the profit factor is um, quite nice for us. I should probably add that to the back desk now. Maybe perhaps in an update, maybe in a part two. Um, so yeah, this would be, let me see, actually, I forgot how much I'm putting on each trade of that account balance, right? So we're starting with a $100,000 account, putting half of it on each trade. And we end up with this back test. We end up with, uh, what are we at at the end? About an 8% return in 12 days, which is sweet, which is pretty sweet. So that is the entire concept, the entire idea of trading with, Oh my gosh, what am I doing? With trading with um, Delta and Gamma exposure. Um, all this code will be in a GitHub repo. I want to thank Data Bento again for sponsoring this video. You guys are awesome. You guys were, you guys are a, um, a pleasure to work with your APIs. Everybody that I've spoken to at Data Bento is quite polite. And um, their CEO can play Coconut Mall um, from Mario Kart on piano. Go follow her on Twitter. I'll put her um, X account in the description as well. And I'll put it on that video so that way you guys get your day brightened up. Watch some piano. Um, right. <laughs> Everything will be in the description. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video a lot. If you did enjoy, I don't really like to ask for subscribers, but I ask for other things all the time. So why not get the video a subscription, uh, get the channel a subscription, go check out data bento to get all the market data you would ever need. And yeah, they have equities as well, but we're just using futures in this video. But yeah, hope that you guys enjoyed it. I will see you guys in the next. Comment videos that you guys want from me. Please comment topics. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Goodbye.